Okay, I am. I, I want to raise some questions that have nothing to do with Kant, I think. Um, and I want to first say, I've heard you talk about this many times, and I think you have got it. This is the best I've ever heard from well, that, your... Give me another 20 years. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll give you all the years you need, it, but it's not up to me. Uh, so I, have, I want to raise two kinds of questions that I think might be related. Uh, one has to do with uh, the remarks you were making at the end that I was already worried about halfway through. Uh, that is Wittgenstein's own attitude towards mathematics and toward in his remarks and so on. Um, and uh, you, you, were, you weren't engaging with those. Um, and you were, at the end, you had, a, uh, you had a way of putting it aside by talking about a time warp. Um, I'm not completely satisfied with that. Uh, I wouldn't, it doesn't even right, seem right to say he was 19th century because Dedek and Cantor and our heroes were 19th century. I, he I, was an engineer. I said, uh, yeah, but, but you know when I said 19th century, I meant 18th century. Okay. Computing and constructing. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but it was even, you know, he was an engineer. Yeah. Okay, so um, that, that's an interesting, um, cognitive dissonance that maybe deserves more reflection uh, and delving into the remarks. The other question has to do with, uh, which I think might be related, is that you talk about grammatical rules, you talk about, very importantly, logic, and logic playing the scaffolding, and then there's the mathematics that's going to be kind of built on that scaffolding or dependent on it for its special kind of rigor and so forth. And it's, and its relation to truth, not just correctness. Um, so that seems to me to kind of call out for you know, more reflection on the relation between logic and mathematics, which of course was a huge issue during all of these uh, developments. And of course, you know, uh, you know pretty much all there is to know about that. Um, but um, merely mentioning Wittgenstein and talking about grammar, which of course isn't about truth and isn't particularly rigorous, talking about logic, which you know, as it was developed, especially as mathematical logic, became like mathematics in its rigor, and then mathematics, um, I mean, what Wittgenstein says about logic and mathematics doesn't seem to be helpful at all. Um, so it, it seems one would need to say something, I mean, I'm just inviting you to you know, say something about how you take uh, logic and mathematics to be related and how that is going to fit with the freedom of Dedekind at all, which, I mean, they weren't emphasizing the relationship between logic and mathematics, certainly, that Frege and Russell were doing, or like the constructivists were doing. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm making Dedekin sense. I'm just trying to raise logic. some things that would be illuminating to hear you say some things about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Dedekind didn't have, uh, you know, any kind of clear conception of, of, of logic that would be adequate quantification. Uh, I mean, when he spoke about his position being logicist, what he meant by that is he didn't invoke uh, uh, inner intuition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But since he does, you know, since he has this this wonderful this notion of free mathematics, but he's not. He's not leaning, you know, he's not invoking, he's kind of avoiding an explicit conception of logic. Yet it seems that what you were appealing to was logical scaffolding as a kind of central way in which we can get rigor that isn't just grammar into you know, mathematical truth. Um, so how do, how do those fit together, I think? Try the question again. Okay, well, suppose you just have grammar and you're just talking about grammatical rules in ordinary language. Yeah. You don't have, you have normativity of a kind, but you don't have anything like rigor and truth as you do in mathematics. You might say, well, you know, the, those norms in mathematics are kind of just like the grammatical norms, only more rigorous or something, but that doesn't seem very illuminating. I heard you saying, well, in between those two things is logic. Logic has one foot in grammar, it has another foot in mathematics and rigor, and that's how we bridge that, you know, that gap. Um, 
So I'm asking about that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I tend to, vi to vision a grammar development of grammar and development of logic in the same way. I mean, just, uh, I mean, after all, Hello. The, the pe people reasoned quantificationally yeah. uh, long sure. before Frege, right? Sure. I mean, sure. Were invented. sure. So it was just, uh, I mean, why wasn't it just part of ordinary language? Um, well, because you don't find rigor and truth like you do in mathematics or freedom in ordinary language and its grammatical rules. Yeah. You have to go somewhere, you have to kind of develop that in a certain direction. Yeah, yeah I, look, I think actually a generative entrenchment bears on this. I am so surprised to hear that. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Why no, did I think As that? surprised as I am to hear you talk about Kant. <laughs> <laughs> you say to me about Kant. Uh, no, no, not this time. Uh, <laughs> no, no, let, me, let me say a little bit about that. So as use becomes more widespread and more polyfunctional, uh, we become more resistant to giving it up. And even giving it up can become uh, kind of incoherent, uh, like you have with the spread of SAE versus uh, uh, metric standards for nuts and bolts. Uh, you literally can't build anything if you've got the wrong thing at that level. And so that, in that way, it's like grammar, but it has a broader reach that merges <coughs> on uh, uh, having lo logical systematicity. But on the other hand, look, I want to say logical systematicity isn't built into language. It's rather we constructed it as an extension of language. And the same kind of thing might be um, found if we moved, say, from natural language to computer programming. Uh, and so I want to say <coughs> that entrenchment actually can get a handle on this. That makes sense to me, but how does that fit in with the Wittgensteinian story that I can, Only the meaning is use. Uh, well, oh, and clearly, uh, I, I mean, I always thought, uh, before Kripke ever said it, this idea that you could go on in an arbitrary way from a thousand is bizarre, because you get a uh, paradigm from place notation. Every time you go up, you proceed in the same way. Um, uh, a habit, is, uh, uh, which is entrenched uh, modes of behavior, uh, gives you that. So I think you can find uh, both the sources of contingency and the source of uh, constrained projection of a method uh, in entrenchment. I mean, you need more, too, but I think that's, uh, that gives you an important element of it. Bill, did you want to say anything about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. learning. Yeah. I, 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 one of the things I found, uh, what, for, here's a thing that I, I, I was fi finding quite attractive once I, be, I thought I was beginning to understand it, and it will help to... So, <coughs> when, when you're talking about, well, thinking about Cantor and introducing things and, and thinking of introducing, say, cardinals and ordinals, extending things like real numbers and those <coughs> more common number notions. Uh, one of the, and, and then you talked about what would happen try, when you try to get introduce some new thing and whether it would work or not. Uh, would you find that attempts to do a fundamental foundation in just set theory, or set theory with proper classes. <coughs> if you're going to get the right things, you've got to, or, or any one of these things is somehow the idea of trying to find an overall uh, framework that you can just fit it all in at once, is something that is a less outrageous way of trying to be like a constructivist, uh, trying to fit everything into one kind of pattern. I mean, constructivist, it's in trying to uh, uh, minimize, uh, that's a matter of the, the, the computing power, as it were. But, uh, but in, in a similar way, it's an open question. You, the, the, the uh, introducing new mathematics can keep happening and to think that you've got one framework that does it all, and it's going to uh, it, it, it is to miss one of the main points of, that we should have learned from how mathematics has developed. Yeah. No, I think mean, yes. I, I think 
it's one of the attractions of set theory, right? Is that, you know, even just from the point of view of, of testing for coherence, you can, it may not be the best way to see it, but you can pack it all into yeah, set yeah. theory. And uh, if, if that's coherent, then your original theory was, uh, ideal was also good for it. Uh, the, of course, the problem is that uh, there's no, uh, there's, I mean, the problem is the question of new axioms for set theory. <coughs> what universe of sets are you talking about? Maybe there's something like the ultimate L or something like that that will, that will serve as the, the, the universe of sets. But, you know, aside from this one use of it, I, I don't actually understand why people are so concerned about yeah, yeah. a one universe of uh, mathematical objects. And of course, then there's the other side of the instructivist and the homotopy type yeah. theory or, or right. bishop analysis or whatever. Uh, so, I mean, I, I see only, I, I see only this advantage that you, that you can have this one test for consistency, uh, whether you, whether your ideas are really coherent, that you can that you can feed them into the universe of sense. Uh, so, uh, the, Bill, in your in the, in your the, the way that you drew out, you know, Wittgenstein's remark that in 201, that, you know, that, that this is the answer to our paradox, there's a way of following the rule, that's not an interpretation of the rule, and you, you spelled it out by, uh, you know, gesturing at uh, dispositions, how, you know, how we would in fact go on, and, well, that, that, that suggests to me the following, that it's at least in some sense of, some sense of possible, possible, that there'd be something like communal dispositional drift. And people would eventually, as communally, people would start you would start drifting into plus instead of plus when using the expression two plus two equals four, fifty-seven plus sixty-eight equals whatever it is. I can find my geometer not the I'm not <laughs> whatever the sum is. So the uh, uh, so presumably you want to say something like the following: Look, uh, there people are the expressions they're using are. Contingent, they're contingent, it's contingent that we've drifted into using plus, but there's still, there's still the relation, there's still the, uh, the arithmetic operation of plus, which exists in some ideal sense and is the, to follow contour, the fruitful and useful one. And mathematicians would somehow recognize this, even though communally people were drifting into, in everyday use, using plus and not plus. But I want to know how mathematicians recognize plus as the useful, fruitful one. The only way I can see that people would realize plus wasn't fruitful or useful is because it doesn't get stuff in the physical world right. But you presumably don't want to say that because- No, say that again. No, that the, 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 the only way I can see that people wouldn't realize that plus wasn't fruitful or useful is because it gets things in the physical world wrong. But you presumably don't want to say that, I'm guessing. No, I, I you, but but but, but, it, but if it's not but, defining but, equation, I yeah. But question. I mean, if it's not but if it's not that, then what are the standards for fruitfulness and usefulness in this free mathematics? It sounds like it's just going to be totally anthropocentric if it's not something that's grounded in how you know at the end how things yeah. work in the physical world. Look, it's it's not a question of of either or. We have quads. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't remember if we actually yeah. defined it, but we could define it, right? Yeah. Uh, it would just be it would right. be but have different equations. Probably not as simple as plus. But yeah. But presumably, I mean, you'd want to say it wasn't fruitful or useful, and that's why mathematicians don't care about it. If you're following the yeah. No, look, it's a question of, of, of whether we, whether the word plus is being, or, or the symbol is, is, uh, is ambiguous or, or not, right? And there's some sense in which that argument is that it's, it's in a way ambiguous, because we haven't, we haven't acted out some of its instances. Uh, and that's what I was uh, arguing against. Not, but the, but both, both functions exist. Right, but, but, but we think one's fruitful and one's well, not. You just don't, don't Why, you separate that? the names. Yeah. Well, I think the fruitfulness could be down to sort of like epistemic usefulness and fruitfulness um, for the understanding of mathematics rather than for, uh, for you know, building bridges and other things having to do with the There might be some mathematical use for plus. So far, we haven't found one. Yeah, that's <laughs> maybe sure. you'd have to ch change uh, 68 and 57 to something else. Right? Yeah, change your notation. Yeah. Um, okay, since no one else's hand is up, I'm going to get one in. Um, 
So of all the things that I could ask you about here, I'm going to pick one that brings us back to Howard, which is that um, in, in the discussions that we've had about yes but, right? About, so, about yes but, the skeptical remarks on realism and ethical realism, right? And this, okay, so I'm, I'm wondering if this kind of connects with with Wittgenstein's seeming inconsistency about um, about abstract objects, right? Um, so, if you're going to be sort of a skeptic about the realist anti-realist debate, there's always a worry that if you're saying, well, there's no real difference between the realism and anti-realism, this is all just a matter matters of language choice, really. Um, then there's a worry that 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 implies, okay, so you're saying then there isn't really any objective truth about whether such and such things exist. And then that seems to just collapse right back into some, some kind of anti realism Well, could, could I say this? Yeah. That I, I probably didn't make the point clearly enough because I made it at the end and I was uh, being a bit garbled. But <coughs> I'm, I'm not taking a side on the realism, anti-realism debate. My, my, uh, my uh, argument is that both sides of the debate are based on an idea that there's a transcendental notion of existence. So, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, my position wouldn't be called, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to call it realism. Yeah, that, that sure. That would put it in, the, in the, the camp of that passage from Wittgenstein. I guess what I'm wondering is whether Wittgenstein might have, Wittgenstein's sort of skeptical attitude towards the realism and anti-realism debate might have led him, might have been kind of contributed to, to his sort of um, aggression towards abstract objects, maybe because of the way that it's sort of hypothesizing these things can lead us into error. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is a question about, about him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he talked a lot to, to Hardy. But, and Hardy was a, a realist, I mean, in some kind of ridiculous way, I mean, but, uh, and, and maybe that was what made it easy for, uh, for Wittgenstein to, to think that, uh, yeah. No, I don't want to interrupt you. I just want uh, to that, that, that Yeah, I mean, he didn't really have a, he didn't really have somebody who was presenting the, the, the view of 19th, 20th century mathematics very clearly. I mean, I think he was, his view of mathematics really was uh, 18th century. I mean, counting, computing. And, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I was just, this is just for clarification so I can understand what you mean by ideal objects a little better. Um, so could you compare it uh, with, compare what you take ideal objects to be with uh, uh, say Shapiro's idea of ideas about mathematical structures, uh, they're kind of ideal types, mm -hmm. right? Abstract. I, I, I'm not familiar with that use of the word type, but yeah. Well, he he makes the analogy with uh, letters of the alphabet. You know, we learn inscriptions and uh, uh, various ways of uh, uh, writing the letters or uh, naming them, uh, but then eventually we latch on to the idea of uh, a capital A or a capital B and so forth, and we're able to think about operations on those. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the, he has this distinction between system and, and structure. A system could contain abstract particulars such as uh, uh, the von Neumann finite numbers. That would constitute a system. But he wants to abstract further from that and talk about the natural number structure. And something like the way that Dedekind seemed to want to do in his correspondence with Weber. Uh, so I wonder, are those ideal objects? Um, well, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, Stewart's um, I mean, my my uh, a paradigm would be uh, the system of of, uh, of, of uh, I call uh, maybe not using the word in his sense the system of natural numbers Euclidean space. These are ideal objects. Right. 
Well, he has them all by those names, but they had this um, special yeah. abstract meaning. Well, I mean, I guess the only way I characterized them was that uh, the facts about the natural world have nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. But the truth about them. Um, well, lunch smells really good, uh, and it's 12. Is, did anybody want to jump in with one last thing? All right, well then let's please thank those. Thank you. Well, I should apologize for this. <laughs> I, I can't see.